Bank churches, rupees, more guap, other heads Draper, never grass CZ Talk about me, I don't care I might invest like Roger there Equity, equity, equity Equity, equity, equity I want more equity it's the future of the internet Blockchain Roger saw it in the early days Visionary Bitcoin.com hey. Lifestyle is much more similar to how humans have existed throughout history We would just do what we needed to do when we needed to do it As my friend the venture capitalist Bill Tai has said on my podcast We lived in a flexible work fabric That meant maybe we would go fishing in the morning Maybe we'd go berry picking in the afternoon and it's only recently that we've become cogs in the wheels of these larger corporations. As a journalist, I report, write, and record my podcasts on my own time, and then I pay myself directly from the revenues of my business. I don't contribute to this larger entity that then pays me a salary and gives the profits over to owners and shareholders. In my world, I am the worker, and the owner and the shareholder. I'm a small corporation, a corporation of me. While this setup isn't incredibly common nowadays, I think it's gonna become a lot more prevalent over the next few decades. It's a trend that could perhaps take down some of the biggest businesses we know today. It could also remake the way many of us earn our money. And the reason for this shift begins with, of all things, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, you might be thinking. Yeah, Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency. Magic internet money. What some people call criminal money. It's that crazy digital asset that was born about 10 years ago. Bitcoin. I started covering Bitcoin in the spring of 2015 when Forbes asked me to head up its FinTech 50 list with another reporter. She and I divided the list into categories, and I took digital currencies. At that point, I fell down the crypto rabbit hole, as they say. For me, learning about Bitcoin was like traveling to a foreign country. Oh, wow. Let's take a peek down that street. Ooh, what's around that corner? Oh, my gosh. Look at that amazing view. But this whole journey was taking place in my own head. After a while, I realized I could not stop turning over in my mind this multifaceted intellectual gem I had found. At that time, I was covering personal finance and career. You know, how to earn money, how, or how to earn more money, how to negotiate your salary, how to retire at 25. I also wrote about freelancing because I was a freelancer. And at first I thought personal finance and career were really different from Bitcoin. The first two topics really didn't change very much, and Bitcoin was constantly changing to the point where I struggled to keep up. But eventually I realized that the two are a lot more similar than I originally thought. Before I explain why, I just wanna say that what I'm about to tell you is gonna seem kinda out there. So I want you to think of my talk today as a visit to you from the future. It's sort of like this photo of a magazine clipping I saw making the rounds on Twitter earlier this year. It's from 1999, and in it, sci-fi author David Gerald was asked to give his description of the future of computing. When you read it now, it is a spot-on description of an iPhone, down to Siri. He even ends it by saying we should dub this device a pain in the ass because it was going to destroy all of our privacy. Well, I don't know if I can be quite as prescient as David Gerald. What I can tell you is what I'm seeing from reporting on the front lines of this technology. It's what I like to call my front row seat to the world's most suspenseful movie, one that's going to last decades. My first takeaway for you from my visit to you from the future is that developers are using the technology behind Bitcoin to create a parallel financial system. Bitcoin was the first time that we had truly unique digital assets. Previously, if I sent you something on the internet, I was always sending you a copy. So if I sent you a Word doc or a text message or a photo, I always had a copy of that Word doc 
that text message, that photo. Now, I could send you a Bitcoin, and everybody in the world could be certain that I no longer had it, and that you had it. With these digitally native assets, with these internet native assets, you could now create an internet of money. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 I already move my money digitally. I log onto my bank website, onto PayPal, onto Venmo. But no, that's all just a digital veneer on this legacy banking system that grew up out of physical and paper money. When I pay you via my bank account, I basically you know, send that message and my bank will debit my account on its ledger, then it will credit your account on its ledger. Those two banks then have to come together and reconcile those accounts. And that process can take days. That's why bank transfers take days often. With Bitcoin, there's one ledger and it's in the cloud. And instead of tens of thousands of employees at these banks managing all these ledgers, it's just a piece of software with Bitcoin. Through my podcast, Unchained, I interview developers who are building what they call the world of decentralized finance. This consists of a number of protocols for financial functions. Our current internet consists of many protocols for communication. For instance, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is how we can all read each other's web pages. SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, is how we can all read each other's email messages. Developers are now creating protocols for financial functions such as derivatives, money markets, debt, credit, exchange, and more. That means someday, instead of putting your money into a money market account at a big bank with all its many employees and branches around the world, you might instead put your money into a money market account created by a smart contract, a piece of software created by a few developers and posted online. In the future, instead of trading a derivative that was created by an investment bank, you may instead trade one that was created using a protocol. This sector that I've just described is really different from this world that we already know of the too big to fail banks. However, I talk to these young developers, many of them fresh out of school, grad school, some of them dropouts, like you know the first uh, wave of tech entrepreneurs. Often they have little to no financial background, but they are creating this parallel financial system that can bypass the traditional banking system. What I've just described to you is actually so new that much of it is either only just launched or is just about to launch. So the sector is tiny, but disruption is coming. My second takeaway for you is that in addition to this open financial system I've just described, we will likely see the emergence of a new business model. You're already familiar with the path that many startups take to becoming public companies. In the future, I think many more services will come to us via leaderless, user-owned, peer-to-peer networks similar to Bitcoin. Let me take a step back. Bitcoin is actually two different things. There's Bitcoin with a lowercase b, which is what I've been discussing so far, which is the digital currency, the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin with an uppercase b is the network. That's what enables you to send $1 million worth of Bitcoin from here to China in 10 minutes for little to no money, especially in comparison to international bank wire transfer fees. This is revolutionary. This system of the payment network and the digital currency was the first time that such things were created using software without a company to keep it all going. If there was no company behind Bitcoin, then who helped steer it to success? It was the users and workers of the system itself. They were the ones who helped grow it to a market capitalization of more than $100 billion, which is more valuable than Goldman Sachs. If there was no CEO and business behind them, then how were they motivated to do so? They were incentivized by the design of the software itself. It was programmed to every 10 minutes release new Bitcoins to anyone who contributed to the security of the network. 
Many people focus on how these miners win new Bitcoin, but you can also think of that as a payment to this leaderless IT department that's helping to ensure the security of the network. So much so that the Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked. In the future, I think many more services future, will come to us via more. these leaderless, user-owned, peer-to-peer networks with a crypto asset at the center that's incentivizing behaviors on that network. That is how now, today, a cryptocurrency miner can look at the cost of their mining equipment, the cost of their electricity. They can project how many of those coins they're expected to earn over time and look at the price of that coin and determine whether or not it will be profitable for them to mine it or not. Similarly, users might look at that network and say, okay, this service is maybe cheaper than using one offered by a middleman. And also, I could be this user owner. I can use this token, but also if more people join, the value of my tokens may rise. The total crypto asset market capitalization is now just over $200 billion. In some ways, it's a small number, meaning I think someday it could be much bigger. And in other ways, it's a big number in the sense that I think much of what's out there today probably won't survive and will go to zero. But it's not that different from the early days of the internet, where people were excited about Pets.com, Webvan, and Cosmo. And yet, out of that same hype cycle, we also got Google and Amazon. My third takeaway for you from my visit from the future is that along with these shifts, we could very well see many more people working for themselves. This is where my previous beats of personal finance and career intersect with crypto. When you take this open financial system, this parallel financial system that I described, with this new decentralized business model, I think we will see many more markets open up that are not open today. We will also see many new channels for us to transact financially. If you're like me, 20 years ago, maybe you woke up and you checked one email address. And now, at least I wake up, I check multiple email addresses, Twitter, Telegram, Signal, iMessages, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, Facebook. And similarly, in the future, I think many people will check on multiple tr financial transactions that occurred overnight, not just in the market of their country's stock exchanges, but in global markets that run at 24-7, 365. I think we will see many of us being able to monetize assets that we currently have that we can't earn money from now, whether it's unused airline miles, whether it's the time and attention you give to an ad, whether it's spare disk storage you have, or idle compute cycles on your laptop while you sleep. Where you're born could have less of an impact on how much you could earn over time. Theoretically, a teenage girl in Bangladesh with access to the internet should be able to plug into these user-owned networks and earn just as easily as a middle-aged man in Silicon Valley. Creators will be able to offer their wares online, whether it's a digital photo, a digital artwork, an MP3, an ebook, an article, and embed a smart contract inside that will ensure that they get paid every time it's consumed. In short, many more people will become the worker, the owner, and the shareholder. The one thing I cannot tell you in my visit from the future is whether or not we really will see these leaderless, user-owned, peer-to-peer networks compete with or even displace these too-big-to-fail banks and these tech giants. After all, many of these big companies are looking to use this technology to cement their dominance. And frankly, regulation will play a role in how this all shakes out. However, if this vision I've painted comes to pass, then I believe many more of you will be quitting your jobs. And when that happens, you won't have to make this big speech with all these elaborate excuses about how the reason you quit was because of your childhood.